My name is Pat Quackenbush, guys. I'm the Parks and Museum Program Manager, and I'm going to be your Hawk Talk today. I am a father of five with two grandkids. They keep me running, keep me like this all the time. So uh, very, very busy all the time. Extended family, and I had no idea we were doing this today when I added this picture, I want you to know. But yes, that is in Mardi Gras in New Orleans. We took that picture right there. I have a lot of extended family down along the Gulf Coast and all that. I don't know what the trivia question is today, so I don't want to steal. I was going to give you one, but I won't do that because I have a feeling it's Mardi Gras themed, I would imagine, right, today. And I have a lot of friends that I love to travel. I've been in a lot of places across the world, and I've spent a lot of time teaching people, including other educators, how to be better educators, specifically environmental educators, right? Because that's what I do. Uh, I am, keep working. There we go. Yeah, because a lot of the paths that we choose make a big difference. What I like to tell folks is when you become an environmental educator and you work outdoors all the time, you really have to be able to look down the trail and see around the bed, right? Everything you're doing, you have to think ahead because you never know what's going to happen in the outdoors when you're teaching somewhere outside. So <clears throat> there was a gentleman by the name of Freeman Tilden. I know the back row knows who he is, right? Or at least some of you, I hope, back there knows who he is. Yeah, hey, Ron does. Good for you. All right. Freeman Tilden was a famous interpretive naturalist, all right? And he worked for the National Park Service, and he wrote a book in which he outlined six principles of interpretation. Now, some of you are thinking, how does this relate to what I do, right? Teaching every day. Our education is a little bit different. We are interpreters. And the biggest difference is this. If you teach at a middle school, or you teach at a high school, or you teach at a college, for the most part, your, your students are required to be there, right? When you teach in the outdoors, and you teach in the park service, and you teach at a metro park, or you teach at a national park, they're not required to be there, are they? So you better be good at educating and entertaining at the same time. And make sure that they want to be there and learn what you have to offer. So we're a little bit different and a little bit unorthodox in our style. But I bring that to Hawking College. And that's the way I teach. And that's the way we do things in Parks and Museum education. So keep going. Yeah, there it is. I'm hitting the wrong button. All right. <clears throat> so what I mean by that is outside, you never know exactly what's going to happen to you when you're out there, right? So everybody, they're all smiling at this. You all like this guy, right? Everybody loves him, especially when they live under your porch at home. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, OK. But I, I love these guys because I tell people all the time, they're, they're actually our friends. They eat massive amounts of, of rodents. They eat lots and lots of insects. They're, they're great. To, you're still not convinced. I can, no, she's not. How about if I told you, as a general rule, they still give you three warnings, right? We all know the business end. We all know what happens, right? If you, if you upset them, it's, a mass, it's, a, it's an amazing defense, right? Who wouldn't love that? So to be able to just scare anybody away you wanted just by turning around backwards to them. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Uh, but this guy does three warnings, and I love it because his warning number one is he's going to stomp his feet at you. He's going to throw a little temper tantrum at you, right? And at this point, you better be paying attention, right? Because warning number two is he's going to turn his back to you just like that, right? You're not sprayed yet. You're OK. But you better really be paying attention. The last thing he's going to do, his final warning, he's going to lift that tail up. You notice how he left it like that, right? You guys want to know a secret? How many of you guys love the smell of a skunk? OK, neither do they. They hate their own smell. So the last thing they want to do is get any of that stuff on them. So what he'll do is he'll take that tail and he'll flip it completely up out of the way. He'll actually pull the fur back away from that gland, and then he'll shoot. How many of you guys knew they had two nozzles? Oh, I love that. Yeah, one of them is kind of like a super soaker. So from right here up to 15 feet away, right between the eyes. I got you, right? OK. The other one, which to me is the more deadly one, is a mister. Yeah. Shh. I didn't get you. I got all of you with that one. OK. So, but they do give you warnings. When you're working in the field, maybe you get a warning. Maybe you don't, right? <laughs> Depending on what happens out there. So. <clears throat> now, there was a famous gentleman. I worked with him for many years. It once told me. You need to learn to be a naturalist vampire. <laughs> I thought, really? Doesn't seem right, does it? Yeah. And what he, it took me a long time to understand what he was talking about. He said, you, you need to learn to do that. Because he, he came into the Nature Center, and I was laying on the chair like this, because we had just finished with 500 sixth graders at an event. I was done, right? And he's, he came in, bumped twice my age, getting a cup of coffee, and he's on, I'm like, how do you do that? He said, you've got to be a naturalist vampire. I said, I didn't know what he meant by that, right? Now, I mentioned this uh, gentleman earlier, but how many of you guys are familiar with Emma Grandma Gatewood? 
No? Really? Thank you. Somebody back there. Yeah, okay, yeah. She was right from southeastern Ohio, and she was 68 years old, and after raising 11 children, this thing called the Appalachian Trail. She thought that might be fun. So she took off with a knapsack and her kids. Everybody knows what those are? Am I old enough? All right, All right sneakers. And she walked the entire 3,000 miles of the Appalachian Trail at 68 years old after 11 kids. She loved it so much, she did it again four years later. And then she went and walked the old Northwest Trail that goes from Maine to Minnesota. And then she went out and did the Pacific Rim Trail that goes all the way down the West Coast. And then she got invited to the White House, and she became one of the nation's leading advocates for trails. Now, more to the story. I'm about this big. I'm about eight years old. And I heard my cousins had come to this little thing over here in the Hocking Hills called the Annual Winter Hike. Right? Now there's some three to 5,000 people that come out to that thing. But back then, much smaller affair. And they came out, and they got to hike with this guy that took them through the whole six miles of the gorge. His name was Norv Hall. My cousins came back and told me all about Norv Hall and how awesome he was. He took us on a hike. He did. They were enthralled by this man. Absolutely loved him. And I said, I'm going next year. I waited a year to get in there. Right? I get there. I go up there. They break us up into our group of about 40, 30, 40 people. And out walked this little old lady. Man, I was madder than fire. Because I've been waiting for a year to have Norv take me on a hike. But, see, things that we do have consequences or experiences that add to our lives later on, right? Little did I know that I was going to be walking with the nation's leading ex expert and advocate for national trail systems all over the country. I spent four hours with her on a six-mile hike. I was about this big, all right? But it was a wonderful, wonderful day. So, back past the, the vampire here, right? Keep going, keep going. There we go. So they lead us to all kinds of choices. I mentioned earlier I spent a lot of time in the Park Service. Most of my time was spent in that. But I also do a lot of historical interpretation, uh, where we go out and we teach living history to people. We do different things like that. But uh, learn to be a little unorthodox. Because how many of you guys in high school loved history class? Good for you. Really? I'm, I'm proud. Good. Yeah, OK. But you notice there was just a smattering of hands out there, right? How many of you guys have ever been to, say, a Colonial Williamsburg? Did you like that? That is an awesome experience. That's an interpretive experience. That's education, and you didn't even know you were learning something, right? So I learned a value uh, of, of being able to shift the way we teach and the way we change. And experiences we do early on help us do that. I had a neighbor who lives right next door to me, brought me this thing. He works at the quarry just south of Lancaster. You guys know what I'm talking about? The rock quarry right there? Go to Lancaster, you know what I'm talking about? And he brought this to me. And he was so excited, he said, this came up on the conveyor belt. And I pulled it off. He said, I knew it wasn't a rock. I said, well, good for you. He said, I knew it wasn't a rock. So I pulled this off. And he said, I, I, I brought it to you because he said, I knew if anybody would know what it is, you would. He said, can you tell me, is this a horse or a cow's tooth? I said, if it is, it's the world's largest horse or cow. <laughs> okay. So I turned to him, and I said, no, 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 you don't understand what you have. I said, this is a baby woolly mammoth's tooth, okay, that came up on that quarry. I said, and the reason you found it there, and the reason you guys are digging up gravel is because you are right at the spot where the Wisconsin glaciers ended. It was right there at that quarry. You look across the street to the other side, you'll see the end moraines where the glaciers ended. We went on for 20 minutes. The guy was absolutely enthralled, right? He walked away with his prize, and he got about 30 feet away, and he turned around and came back to me, and he said, you know what? You can do a lot more than this than I ever will. Share it with everybody. But you know what? To this day, I, can, I still hear this guy telling people about the Wisconsin Glacier and how it came down. He still teaches everybody else that little bit that he learned. So just something simple as a big tooth. All right, it is a cool one. I'll give you, I'll give you that. It is a cool big tooth. But it was something as simple as that can help change the way you do things. So <clears throat> I didn't spend a lot of time underwater, <laughs> which is why sometimes, Ron, I have trouble hearing the little tiny birds out there now. Yeah, but... Um, and I did a lot of historical interpretation, and that can go a lot of different ways, too. I love Appalachia because I came here, and somebody showed me all about these things. You know what those are? Oh, who said that? Where are you? What are they? I'm going to set that down. Let me forget that, right? Okay. These are divining rods or dowsing rods, and what do you do with them? You find water. Absolutely, you find water. And I thought, naturalist, scientist, ah, that doesn't work, right? That doesn't work. Actually, it does. 
The science behind it is they work on magnetic fields. And, and can, I, can I borrow you? Come on, just, all you got to do is stand here. That's all you got to do. Stand right here. So I learned that, and you can face them, that's fine. You guys are going to love this. A lot of people don't realize our bodies are really good at gathering in magnetic fields and bringing it up through our bodies, right? They're very, very good at it. So I'll take these guys out. I'll hold them out in front of me, nice and level, and I'll go over top of her and watch what happens. There they go. No, I'm not doing that, okay? And I walk away. You have a very magnetic personality. You know? <laughs> All right. So simple. they're cool for finding water because it's... Thank you. You can sit down. Thank you. As water moves underground, it moves very quickly, and it also draws in magnetic fields. So they actually work. They really do work. They're not magic. Although the settlers thought they all were, right? They thought they were all magic. Uh, also, you can use a crystal on a string, and it'll rotate. And if I did that over top of you, if it went clockwise, you're having a boy. If it goes counterclockwise, you're having... <laughs> anyway. I don't know if that one works, but yeah, that's part of it anyway. So yeah. <clears throat> so if you really want to learn something, you got to get into it. Now, if you don't know this young lady, she's Caitlin. She's a naturalist from Lake Hope. And I saved this picture, and she threatened me because I want you to look at her face as she was crawling out from under that rock. Um, she wasn't thrilled about it. But if you think her face was bad, this one right here was repeating to me over and over again, I love my job. I love my job. I love my job. So I always, you know, I tell my students this too. Somebody asks you to dig a ditch, and they're going to show you how to dig a ditch. Dig the ditch because you're going to learn something. We dug that ditch in Old Man's Cave, and when we got it all done, we were, we're doing some work in there. Somebody came along, and they pointed at a rock down at the bottom, and we did a 10-minute interpretive talk on the sandstone and iron in the Hocking Hills because we dug a hole. All right? You never know where these moments are going to come from and how you can use them. All right? You might learn a brand new skill that you never had before, all right? uh, such as stand-up paddleboard. These two had never been on a board in their life. And within 10 minutes, we had them out there doing it and having a great time with it. So yeah. All right, so anything you come along. Hibernating bats, which I know the president loves them. <laughs> we had a discussion about that. Uh, we participated in a hibernation study. Uh, how about those little guys that you can barely see on that branch right there? Those are called beach aphids. <laughs> I learned another name for them, <laughs> fat fairies. Somebody made it, and it fits. They look like little fat fairies when they fly through the air. Okay, yeah. They're pretty much harmless. They do feed off of beech trees, but they generally don't kill the tree, maybe a branch, but they're pretty harmless as far as that goes. And how about that spotted salamander that one of my students said, straight out of a Dr. Seuss show, right? Sure does look like it, all right? All of those can become stories later on. I've had the great fortune of working at some very beautiful locations. And through those, I also developed a, a, a really good time working on about five different Hollywood movie scripts and several TV shows after, which was a lot of fun. Got to see how that all works and realized I don't want to do that for a living. Um, but it was fun, all right? This, this, by the way, if you see me afterwards, if you want to know, this was just filmed about three years ago. It's out right now. It's a horror movie if you want to know all about it. So, yeah. Conkle's Hollow you're looking at there where they filmed that. And I've managed to get into some really culturally diverse programming out there. Um, one of the things that I very quickly realized is something as simple as that rock right there. It doesn't look like much, does it? A little boulder? But that groove you see down the side of it, 10,000 years old. It's a sharpening groove where the Adena and the Hopewell or the Paleo people were sharpening their stone axes in the side. That symbol next to it that looks like, a, I always say, the setting sun or the top of a pineapple, right? That's a burial marker. So it was an easy decision when several remnant Native American tribes came and said, we would like to, on the summer solstice, hold a drum circle every year. It was a logical place to do that. And I learned a lot about different cultures and how they view the world and how, how things are different for them. All of these experiences play into what we do every day. Try your hand at turkey calling. Anybody any good at it? No? You are? Ward? Good for you. All right. Yes. I'll have to chest you on that one day. Okay. Uh, we had a bunch of students out today hunt, hunting for a hemlock woolly adelgid. A little microscopic guy almost, about the size of a pepper flake. That enough of them gang up, they can kill hemlock trees. Fascinating little creature. Okay. Um, keep clicking. There we go. All right. How about making your own maple syrup? Anybody ever done it? You do it right on the stove in your kitchen if you want to, right? Uh, it takes a little while. If you have any wallpaper, you won't when you're done, but that's beside the point. So yeah. Uh, how about this one? We made a rock mold for a new display we did down there, right? We went out in the middle and we took a mold of a rock and we made a big display out of it. All these are unique experiences, but they all teach us how to relate. How many of you guys, please tell me, a lot of you guys have been out hiking in this area and explored the old times. They're everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. We spend a lot of time doing that. So, <clears throat> 
What's your story to share, right? I'll set this up here before I forget. I brought a friend with me, if that's okay. You ready? Okay. I brought a friend with me. And <clears throat> I brought him because you never know what's going to happen when you work with live animals. Sorry about the front row. Uh, so anybody from the lodge in here? Okay, good. All right. Um, <clears throat> because this particular young lady is uh, hopefully taking care of all of her special needs inside here. Come out of there the nice way. There we go. There we go. All right, so this is, all right, natural resources. Or, no, not natural resources. Somebody else. Who is this? What? Red-tailed hawk, right? Not a blue hawk. I got the coaches raising their hand. Not a blue hawk, okay? I hate to tell you this. There is no such thing as a blue hawk. It's a red tail. This is a red tail. Yeah. This is a red tail. With the biggest hawk we have in Ohio, right? Where right now our students are going through how to learn to program with these guys and how to present them. And they're cool. You can stand up here with an animal on your arm like this, right? Eat your chickens. They would if, they, if the chickens are running around. Yeah, they, now, they're not as notorious as the great horned owls, though. They, yeah. Great horned owls, though, you guys want to know a secret? The nickname for great horned owls, right? The wise old owls, right? When it comes to the intelligence scale, they're at the bottom. Sorry. Okay, if your, eye, if your head is three-quarters eyeball and ear, doesn't leave a whole lot of room for? Brain. So, yeah, owls are notorious. They, they occasionally will go after the chickens, right? And they will fly in, and they are so powerful. 500 pounds per square inch on a great horned owl in the town. This bird's got 250 pounds per square inch of crush. Where's my math teachers in here, right? You don't have to be. That's impressive, right? <laughs> That's impressive. But great horned owls come in. They attack from behind, right? So they don't, the prey doesn't run away. They grab them by the back of the head, and they're so powerful, the head of a chicken just kind of goes. <laughs> Remember, they're not too smart, right? So the great horned owl flies off with the chicken head. Gets all the way back to his branch. And I always imagine that owl standing on the branch going, it was so much bigger when I started this. Yeah. So, and we'll get calls in the morning of, hey, I've got a headless chicken now. What happened here? Yeah. But these guys are amazing tools for the job that we do. But that's what they are. They are not pets. Please understand that. I can't tell you how many folks ask me if they can pet the hawk. We like everybody to leave the same amount of fingers they came with, right? He doesn't like it. But they're amazing tools for interacting and teaching people about the outside world, right? They're also quite interesting. You better, you better be able to ride on the fly here when you're teaching with these guys. That's gonna, no pun intended, sorry. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen when you're using these guys. Uh, she's a veteran. She's 16 years old. Uh, in the wild, she could live to be about 20. In captivity, we've had these birds live over 30 years. That's in a perfect world. It's like us living to 100. Okay. In a perfect world, they can live to that age. They are amazing, amazing predators. They're a great tool for programming, but you better be ready for something different, right? It's going to happen every single time. So we were talking about raptors in general one time, and I was explaining to people there are four types of raptors. Who knows what they are? Hawks are one. What are the other raptors? Owls. Falcon's a type of hawk, so, but yes, yeah. What else is in there? How about our national symbol? Eagle. And then one more. Uh, osprey is, 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 is in that group, but there's, they're not classified all by themselves. They're usually classified in the, in the hawk group. One last one. Okay, I'll give you a hint. Their food doesn't run away. Vultures. There they are. Okay. Now, a lot of you guys don't know this, but anatomically, if you take the feathers off a vulture, right? An ornithological society puts them in the raptor group, and then sometimes they take them out, put them in another group, and then a few years later they put them back. They can't make up their mind because anatomically, a vulture actually resembles a stork. They're built like a stork. And uh, I joked about that one day. I said, but who would want a vulture bringing their baby to them, right? I'm looking at you because you've got a new one at home, right? You wouldn't, yeah. <laughs> who would like their, uh, a, a vulture to bring their baby to them, right? And one of the kids in the group, you talk about moving them to fly, a little guy, about, about uh, six years old, or excuse me, about sixth grader, raised his hand. He said, they're the ones that bring the goth babies. <laughs> I have used that ever since. <laughs> ever since. So you never know where inspiration is going to come from. So... But gave you a little glimpse into what an interpretive naturalist does. We are a little bit entertaining. We're a little bit education. But our job is to make sure that when we're done, you love this bird. You love Hawking Hills. Whatever it is that we're talking about, we want you to be in love with it. And that's what I teach them, how to make that emotional connection. But you have to draw on your life experiences. And the, more, the longer you're a naturalist and an interpreter and a teacher, the better you get, right? You have more of those experiences to draw on and pull in. Right? So I wish you the best of luck, and I hope you all come up with a really, really great story to share with everybody. So thanks for letting me spend a few minutes with you.
Have a good one. <laughs> okay. Good for you. You were a good bird. <laughs>